Hey Phys One Kids, Campbell here. In our first video on momentum and impulse, we're going to talk about what is momentum and what is impulse and how are they related to each other. Now what momentum is, and the symbol of momentum is a P. I'm, I'm not really sure why, but I guess we wouldn't want to use an M because that stands for mass. Um, but momentum is a product of mass and velocity. So if I were to calculate the momentum of an object, I'd take its mass in kilograms and I'd multiply by its velocity in meters per second. So the units of momentum are kilogram meter over second. Momentum is a vector, right? Velocity is a vector, momentum is a vector. And in fact, that vector points in the same direction as the velocity vector of the object. So if I have a mass here that's moving in this direction, right, that's velocity is in this direction, then its momentum is also in that direction. Now, because it's a vector, anytime I have momentum or velocity at an angle, remember we have to split vectors into components. So for an object that's traveling at an angle, um, I have an X component and a Y component if it's moving at an angle to the horizontal. This is just a reference table of different momentum. And you can see that momentum can be very small or very large. It just depends upon the mass and velocity of the object. They equally contribute to the momentum, but you can see that usually speeds of an you know, object speeds are pretty small, right? A bullet at 500 uh, meters per second um, still has a small momentum because its mass is so small. So usually uh, something that's more massive will have a higher momentum just because it's easier to be more massive than it is to be fast. What causes a change in momentum? So I have a little ball here, and when I drop it, right, it's, as it falls, right, it gains speed, so it's gaining momentum, right, the mass didn't change, but it's gaining speed, so it's gaining momentum, and then it collides with the surface, right, and it bounces back up, which means its direction of velocity changed, so its momentum changed again. So what caused that? Well, during the drop, what causes the object to speed up? Well, it's a force, right? The force of gravity. And what causes whoa, it to bounce back up? Well, that's the force of impact with a table, right? Like a normal force. So it's forces that cause a change in momentum. And in fact, there's a name for that. It's called impulse. Impulse is symbolized by a J. Again, don't know why it's a J, but it's a J. And what it is, it's a force that acts over a time interval. And a force that acts over a time interval will change the momentum of an object. Now, the units of that, of course, would be Newton seconds, because force is Newtons and time is seconds. It is also a vector, right? Force is a vector. Momentum is a vector. And that impulse vector points in the direction that the net force acts. Now, we call this net force an average force. And the reason why we call it an average force is if we took a graph of the force uh, versus time during that uh, collision, like hitting a golf ball or kicking a soccer ball or hitting a tennis ball or slapping your friend, if we measured that force over the interval, you'd see that the force would increase to a maximum and then decrease. So in the case of something like the force of gravity, well, that would be a constant force, but when it's a collision, that force is normally some sort of curve. So we take the average of the force when we calculate the impulse. Now, another thing that's very important, I want you to write this down because you're going to see this. Anytime you see a graph of force versus time, the area under the graph, right, area base times height is force times time, which is impulse. So the area under a force time graph is impulse, and impulse, and we're going to see the derivation of this in a minute, impulse is equal to the change in momentum. But let's do a calculation first. Here I have a rubber ball that I dropped, and it experiences this force. Um, the maximum force is 300 newtons over 8 milliseconds. What is the impulse of the ball? Well, the impulse of the ball is the average force times time, or it's the area under the graph. So my area under my graph here, right, is a triangle, so that'd be one half base times height, or one half eight milliseconds, so that's times 10 to the negative third for milli, times 300 newtons. All right, so if you plug that in your calculator, you will get 
two Newton seconds. Oops, sorry about that little Newton seconds. Now, what is the average force on the ball? Well, there's two ways we could get that, right? If this is the impulse, and impulse is equal to force times time, or the average force times time, then 1.2 is equal to the average force times 8 milliseconds. So we could just do that math, and we would find out that our force average, sorry, my writing is horrible, is 150 newtons. How else could you get that? Well, the average force is just an average of the force. So it went from 0 to 300. So we could also do F average is the average here, which would be 1 half times 300. Because this is nice and symmetrical, which, again, is 150 newtons. All right, area under a graph of force times time is impulse, which is equal to the change in momentum. Now, how do I know that that's equal to the change in momentum? Well, let's go back to kinematics and forces from first semester. Let's take a look at a block. A block is moving with some initial velocity, and I apply a force to it over a period of time, and it causes the block to accelerate to some final velocity. So I have a force applied over time that changes the velocity of my block. Now, if I wanted to, say, calculate the final velocity, or maybe I measured that and I want to calculate the acceleration, I would use this kinematic equation, my favorite kinematic equation, final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Well, remember that acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. So if I plug that in for acceleration, I get this. Hmm this, right? That's impulse. So let's rearrange this equation to solve for impulse. So that means I need to move that final velocity, I need to move that initial velocity over to the final velocity, and then I need to multiply both sides by m, and then I get this by itself. And, oops, I thought I wrote that in the right spot. I did not. So when I further distribute the m, this is what I get. m times v. Hmm, momentum. So this is the impulse and momentum theorem. Anytime I have an impulse, it equals the change in the momentum of the object. And make sure you pay attention to direction, because if the velocity changes direction, then one of your velocities is going to be negative, and the other is going to be positive. For example, the bouncing ball. Right? On the way down, the velocity is negative. On the way up, the velocity is positive. So velocity is a vector. So make sure that you pay attention to the direction when you calculate the change in momentum. Let's take a look at another calculation. Ooh. Here I have a 50 gram golf ball leaving the face of a club at 20 meters per second. Here is the time, 0 0.002 seconds, and what is the average force on the ball? Why don't you pause the video and see if you can solve this. Well, if you did this correctly, you would have your impulse momentum theorem equation. The initial momentum is zero, it's at rest. The ball has to be at rest or that's a rule violation. And if we do some rearranging to solve for force, we get the final momentum divided by time is equal to the average force, which gives you 500 newtons. How'd you do? So I have two balls here. They both have equal mass. And so if I drop them from the same height, due to laws of kinematics and forces, they will hit with the same velocity, which means they have the same momentum. So let's do that. Let's drop them. What? Wait, one bounced, one stuck. Let's do that. that that's crazy. So I have a bouncy ball and I have a sticky ball. Which one has a greater change in momentum? What do you think? So which has a greater change in momentum? Bouncy ball or sticky ball? Well, if we look at a change of momentum, right? Change of momentum would be mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. Well, for my bouncy ball, let's say that there was we lost no speed in the collision, so the momentum immediately following the bounce was the same as the momentum right before the bounce. So if we look at the change in, moment, change in momentum 
for our bouncy ball, right, we would have a M V final, which would be the same as our initial. So we're going to say that the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity minus our mass negative V initial, right? It was going, oops, and we're going to get rid of the initial, right? Because we said it was going down first, right? So that's a negative velocity. So that means for bouncy ball, we have a final change in momentum of 2 mv. If we look at the scenario for sticky ball, right, he had zero final momentum and only our initial momentum, which means that sticky ball only has a change in momentum of mv. So bouncy ball actually has twice the change in momentum than our sticky ball. So what does that mean about the impulse? Which one has a higher impulse? I know you want to say sticky, right? But remember that impulse equals a change in momentum. So the impulse applied to the bouncy ball is twice as big as the sticky ball. So think about that though, because sticky ball, right? The force just stops the ball. Bouncy ball, the force has to stop the ball and then push it back up. Twice as much force, twice as much change in momentum. Huh, pretty cool. One last question for you. I have a 500 gram baseball that's moving to the left at 20 meters per second and hitting a bat, and then it leaves in the opposite direction at 40 meters per second. What's the impulse applied to the ball? Pause this video, see if you can figure this out. Well, impulse equals a change in momentum. My final momentum is 0.5, the mass of the ball, because remember you have to do it in kilograms, times 40. And then we're going to subtract the initial momentum, which is negative because it's going to the left. Well, I guess on your screen it's that way. Um, so we're actually adding those momentums together and we get 30 Newton seconds. Don't ever forget that momentum is a vector. So if it's moving in the opposite direction, one of those has to be negative. Now, what if the ball stuck to the bat? I know, crazy, right? How would a baseball ever stick to a bat? But what if it did? What would the impulse be then? Well, then we'd have no final momentum, right? So it'd all be the initial momentum. So now our impulse is only 10 Newton seconds, right? 0.5 times 20. A lot less. So bouncy is better. So if you need to make something close, throw something at it that's going to bounce, not something that's going to stick. Psychologically, your brain wants to say sticking is better. But from a force standpoint, you want to bounce. All right, fill out your WSQ, and I will see you in class.